Well, good morning, everybody. If you would, stand and let's worship this morning. foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. This morning, we want to sing about that foundation, that cornerstone foundation, which is strong and steadfast. Thank you. 
Welcome, church family. How are y'all? Hey. Oh, come on. You remember that. Hey. Well, we'd like to welcome you tonight. Our pastor is uh, with his family up in uh, Mississippi today. Brother Chris is going to be bringing us the message today, so we're looking forward to that. So I'm here to welcome you. It is a nice time of the year. We have a lot of folks, of course, traveling. One of the nice things about it is we have folks who are coming back who have visited us, uh, members coming back and, and visiting with us today, so that's a great thing. Also, somebody has come to visit uh, I just have to say, who has the newest grandchild in the church family whose name is Kyle Jacob Eamon, who was born Christmas Eve and is, weighs 6 pounds, 14 ounces, and it was 19 inches long? Who would that be? Grandma over there at the piano. And, yes. Uh, oh, yeah, that would be us. Okay, so that's new. Uh, we're happy about that going down there. So, kind of neat. Yeah, we were driving to church uh, Christmas Eve for the service to get that FaceTime call. And I, I better pull off the side of the road before I look at this. That was that was a blessing, you know. But our hope, of course, is that like everybody, they come to know. These our third one, third grandson from there. They have three boys. We had three boys. So, five, three, and zero. Two days. I wouldn't count that, you know, so anyway, but, you know, come to know a saving relationship with Jesus Christ as we all come to know that. We pray for that, humbly ask for that to have happen, and that's what this is all about, this Christmas time, this Christmas saving. Our Savior came, and we celebrate that time now. Uh, just a quick announcement, uh, we'll still have the church will be open this week, but there are no Wednesday services this week, the church will be close, and nothing Wednesday night uh, going on here. So, see you back on Sunday morning. So, welcome. Please enjoy. Join us in continuing our worship. Thank you. Stand as we continue to worship this morning. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We gather together. Lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace, and hear the joyful sound of our offering, as your saints bow down, as your people sing, we will rise with
Myrtle Grove Baptist Church, would you join me in prayer, please? Father God, we come to you this morning. We're just thankful, Lord, for you sending your son Jesus to die on that cross those many years ago. And this is the time of year that he was born. So we just give you thanks for that, Father. Just be with our pastors. He's not here this morning, Lord. Be with Brother Chris as he brings the message. If there's one here that does not know you, they will before they leave today, Father. Bless these tithes and offerings and use them to further your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray, amen. <laughs>
right. Thank you, Miss Betty. That was beautiful this morning. Thank you for playing that for us. And I just say to the worship team, a couple of you guys could have stayed up here on the stage and let me some moral support this morning. I would have appreciated that, but uh, it kind of feels like it's me against you guys now. But uh, I know that's not the case. And I thank you all for your prayers and for your uh, support and uh, just for your words of encouragement this morning, as I don't get to do this very often. But again, just... Uh, I am grateful for the opportunity, and again, just as, as Roy had mentioned, our pastor being away from us today and some traveling, uh, that again, just uh, lift him up in prayer, and that he is enjoying this time away with his family and uh, just uh, with the grandparents and, and such, and the children, and, uh, and where they are, and just to bring them back to us next week uh, to be with us again next Sunday. So, congratulations, you guys. It's December 26th. We, we, you've made it through another Christmas season, a Christmas holiday, and you're here at worship this morning. If you want to give yourself a hand this morning, you can do that. And uh, I know in our, our world, in our society, that's uh, not an easy feat to accomplish sometimes. You know, during these this time of the year and this season that we've just come through, you know, you've had uh, class socials, work parties, uh, school plays, uh, extra practices and rehearsals to go to, and uh, extra meals uh, as well during this time and food to prepare uh, and all those things that, that, that happen during this season. So, you know, this, this season that we talk about bringing peace on earth uh, to all mankind is usually sometimes anything but peaceful. You know, sometimes the relatives that we see a couple of times a year are, are, are gone back home and, uh, you know, where they came from. You know, your tree uh, is probably still up at the house if you're like most of us, and some of you might leave your tree and your lights up for several months to come, I, you know, and just until to save time for next year, I suppose that could be the case, but not, not, we don't do that, of course, but, uh, uh, you know, I was able to, to watch uh, uh, bits and pieces of It's a Wonderful Life yesterday, which I was thankful for, you know, I know that movie well enough that I can fill in the pieces that I miss, and uh, I know... The Bagley's still got eight thousand dollars, and and Clarence still got his wings, and I still I still had a tear in my eye uh, when the movie was over with. But uh, but we're grateful for that, and uh, you know as I said, uh, this time of year brings great stress and it brings great joy, and we look forward to it all year long. But we also uh, are kind of take a deep breath or a sigh of relief when it's over with. Um, this morning. You know, and over the past weeks, we've looked at Luke 2, and we talked about the songs and the prayers of, of various uh, people in Luke 2, Zechariah, Mary, Elizabeth. Uh, last week, I believe Pastor Josh talked about Simeon, uh, you know, when Jesus was presented at the temple, and, uh, and, and those folks that we talked about uh, in the last several weeks. But this morning, we're going we're gonna to move over to, uh, to, to Matthew, and Matthew gives us a little more detail about what happened in the, the days and months uh, in the time after the birth of Jesus. You know, and as I mentioned in Luke 2, you know, it just uh, it talks about the shepherds, it talks about the angelic announcement, and we see the, the beautiful picture of the nativity uh, that happened uh, there in Luke. But, um, you know, after, at the end of, of that, that chapter, it really just kind of sums up the, uh, the next several years there in, in verse 30, uh, 39 and 40, uh, it just, uh, you know, Luke goes on to say, uh, and when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town, and the child grew and became strong and filled with wisdom and in favor, and the favor of God was upon him. And then, and then in the next verse, we see Jesus as a 12-year-old, uh, you know, when he's teaching in the temple and, and you know, and, and is separated from Mary and Joseph, and, and he's there doing his father's business as he said at that time. So we, we, we don't get much of that in those intervening years uh, there for uh, the, the fill in the blank in Luke. But uh, this morning, and before we get to, to Matthew 2, I just want to touch base on our biblical truth this morning, as you see here as well. And I, I thank Sue for, for prettying that up for me uh, yesterday as uh, all this is trying to, to get this thing together. Uh, and it kind of went different directions and uh, on me and uh, wasn't sure how it was going to turn out until it got down. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll find that out together this morning. But uh, uh, the best place for us to be is to be where God wants us. And uh, I think uh, there may be a better, a better way to say that grammatically. I don't know. But, but I think that that's the truth that I hope we can 
take a hold of this morning uh, uh, together as we wrestle with the Scripture uh, this morning. It may say something to you that it didn't say to me. You may glean a truth out of it that I haven't seen. But I'm just going to share with you this morning some things as I, I read these 10 or 11 verses that, that jumped out at me from, from the text and, and, and what the Spirit of God told me in the text. Uh, before we, uh, again, we get to Matthew and in in our passage today, we see that Joseph in the first chapter of Matthew in, in chapter, in verse 19, you know, Joseph is described as being a godly man. He's described as being a righteous man because you remember when he found out about Mary and her pregnancy, it says, you know, he didn't, he wanted to divorce her quietly. He wanted it to not be a public spectacle for her, not to embarrass her in any way as if, as he were to, to separate from her, you know, and then in the next verses, uh, there after 19 in verse one, in chapter one and 20 and 25, you know, it talks about how the angel uh, appeared to Joseph and he explained that the Mary had been conceived by the Holy Spirit and that it was a child of God and it was, uh, you know, and he should not be afraid to take her home to be his wife. And again, uh, and we'll see this examples of this later on in the scripture as well today that you know Joseph did just as the angel had told him just as the spirit had directed him and it says that he did as the lord had commanded and uh, we're thankful today for joseph's obedience and for his his spirit of his understanding and his his willingness to follow the follow god um, but in these verses we'll go ahead and, and read our, our text now this morning like i said beginning in uh, verse 13 of matthew 2 we'll read on through to 23 it says <clears throat> It says, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. And they remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt. I will call. I called my son. And we go to verse 16. It says, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, and the voice was heard in Ramah, Weeping and a loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they were no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and he took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when they heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod. He was afraid to go there, and being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he shall be called a Nazarene. And uh, again, just as, as we see a lot of references in these scriptures, first of all, just to say, you know, we see a lot of references to the, pro the words of the prophets were fulfilled, the words of the prophets were fulfilled, and and Jeremiah and Hosea and Micah and, and various prophecies there, and really just a, just a little bit of housekeeping. That the initial readers of this of this Matthew, you know, they were of, of Jewish people of Jewish faith, of Jewish background, and, and it was very important for Matthew to establish that this was the fulfillment of those prophecies. This was the Messiah. This is the one that the law and the prophets had promised. It was the Christ child. And this was the, that fulfillment. And he really wanted to make a, make a point to, 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 for the people to know that. So we see um, in the first verses, though, of Matthew, uh, Matthew 2 there, it was the, uh, the, the description of the wise men of the Magi uh, coming uh, to, uh, to visit with Jesus. And they had uh, presented their gifts to him, and they had returned home. Uh, but again, they were warned in a dream not to go back to Herod to report what they had seen. And we, and we see that there. Uh, in verse 13, we, uh, we read that also that, Matthew, that Joseph was warned in a dream to flee to Egypt for the safety of the child. Now, Herod the Great was the ruler at that time in that area uh, and where Jesus was born. And he 
heard, you know, the king of the Jews. So he, he, he read that as being this is a, a potential political rival to me and to my family, and uh, that, that potential rival has to be taken care of. It has to be done away with. So, you know, Micah the prophet foretold that the king of the Jews would be born in Bethlehem. So he, he, he was going to eradicate this potential uh, threat to his family's power. But what we see this morning from our verses, and we'll go ahead and, and jump to that slide, there's some things that were, are, I think, that, that may jump out to me uh, this morning that we, that we see. And one that I mentioned this morning that we see from our scripture today is that Joseph was obedient to God. He obeyed God without question. You know, it, it says here, you know, when, when he had the dream, uh, you know, if he didn't wait till morning, he didn't, uh, he didn't, you know, take care of business on other, on, uh, and other things, but he, he packed up the family and he headed out to Egypt. He acted immediately on what he was told and, and he did so. You know, if we think about this and what this meant for Joseph and for his family, uh, you know, he and Mary had traveled from Nazareth to Bethlehem, and they had been there, you know, as we see for the census and, and, and that earlier. Uh, you know, and I think they were probably only expecting to stay away from home probably for a short period of time when that happened. Uh, you know, they, had, they certainly hadn't planned on moving the, the family and everything that they owned all the way to Egypt, you know, in, in their territory there. You know, I'm sure that Joseph and Mary had friends back in, in Nazareth and uh, we read in Matthew 13, uh, 55, you know, that they, when they talk about Jesus, they said, is, is he not the, uh, is he not the, excuse me, when we read about Joseph, we say, is he not the son of the carpenter? You know, Joseph was uh, a, the carpenter. Uh, and uh, so I'm sure, you know, he had a business, he had a, a following, he had people and, and, and that he did things for, that he worked for, uh, that where we would call his customer base. But he had to leave all those things behind. But in the middle of the night, Again, we see God said move, and Joseph didn't bargain. He didn't ask for a plan B. He simply obeyed. You know, God knew Joseph's heart. God knew that Joseph was a believer and that he had faith, and that's why he was chosen uh, for this role. But secondly, we see that Joseph was obedient, but we also see that God provided for Joseph and Mary. You know, we think of others in the Bible that, that, that uh, God calls to do things that or seem uh, out of bounds or seem uh, very difficult or, you know, that we wouldn't understand. Uh, you know, he called Moses. Moses says, I cannot speak. I can't, I'm slow of tongue. You know, he provided Aaron to, to work alongside of him to speak uh, for him. You know, when uh, we think of Abraham, you know, he was called uh, uh, by God to sacrifice his son Isaac. You know, and when Isaac would ask the question as they were as they were approaching that place, or as they were approaching the mountain. You know, Isaac said, "Well, where's the where's the ram? Where where's the sacrifice?" And and Abraham told him, he says, "God will provide." You know, that's where we get Jehovah Jireh, God is my provider. You know, that's where that's where that uh, originated. That's where we see that. You know, God called the widow of uh, Zarephath to to feed uh, Elijah. Uh, you know, for her last bit of bread. You know, and she had no oil, she had no, no flour. But when she she was obedient, and and she fed him, and then God provided. And he, he her oil and her flour did not run out until the famine in that land was over. And that's in First Kings, seventeen. But we see again, this is another example of that when God calls, or God gives us direction, that He provides the means to accomplish what He wants us to do. So He told Mary and Joseph. To go, but he did not send them empty-handed. I don't. I don't think it's in, uh, uh, an accident, you know, that we see this right after the wise men had been there. You know, if we if we want to be very practical with uh, with the gifts that the wise men provided, you know, there are some various traditions as to, you know, Judas took them that that these were the myrrh and the frankincense were used to anoint Jesus's body after the crucifixion. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us. Uh, you know, what was done with the gifts that the wise men brought. But, you know, if those gifts were very symbolic, as we know, but they were also very valuable, I, I can think that maybe Joseph and Mary needed a little bit of money to, to travel on as they, they, took, they left Bethlehem to go to Egypt. And, you know, if necessary, uh, Joseph could have used those things to trade and, or to sell to, to provide for his family as they traveled and as they were going from place to place as they were displaced from their home. 
So God provides. We, we can see that. I know that we probably all could have some kind of personal story or personal testimony of God asking us or, or, or requiring something of us and us not knowing how that would happen or how that would come about. But God provided in the end. Also, we see that Herod opposed God's plan this morning. You know, Herod, again, had learned from the wise men about Jesus. And, you know, Herod was a cruel and vicious uh, leader, dictator, uh, ruler. You know, of course, he had, he had many wives and many branches of his family tree. And, and very, those various branches of the family tree, of course, were, would contend for power and, and, and compete for power in the family and those in factions. You know, Herod is uh, known he's to have at least two of his own sons killed, you know, and other family members killed that he thought were a threat to his power or to his authority. Uh, even as I've seen this quote before that Caesar Augustus said this, he said, it is better to be a pig in Herod's household than to be his son. So it was just that dangerous at that time. Of course, now, uh, you know, and what Herod ordered, uh, what we, we see in some Bibles or some headings, uh, you know, was the massacre of the innocents. And again, verse uh, 18, there are quotes uh, from the prophet Jeremiah, you know, and that was the fulfillment uh, of that prophecy there. But, uh, you know, as he had ordered the children, the boys under two years old, uh, to, be, to be killed. So even from the very beginning, Herod and others and in, uh, those in authority, those in power, opposed Jesus. They opposed God's plan. Um, you know, later we saw the religious leaders of Israel, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the high priests, oppose and try to trick and try to ask Jesus questions that would get him in trouble. You know, and eventually they, he was arrested and eventually he was crucified. But, of course, we know the rest of the story this morning. Uh, but, again, that was because the powers and the authorities opposed God's plan. You know, Matthew 10, 22, when Jesus is giving instructions to his disciples, uh, and he sends them out. He says, all men will hate you because of me, but he who stands until the end will be saved. So, you know, the enemy will use any means he can, any means necessary to thwart the mission of the kingdom of God. And evil will always stand in opposition to the truth, in an opposition to God's purpose, in an opposition to God's people. But we also see this morning that God's will was not thwarted. God had a plan to carry out and to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. You know, God's plan was to call Jesus back from Egypt. You know, and then again, Matthew 2.15, uh, he quotes there from Hosea 11.1, uh, and he says, uh, out of Egypt I called my son. And, you know, and, uh, you know, he had done that 1,500 years later, you know, with, earlier with Moses and, uh, and calling the Israelites uh, out of Egypt. You know, we, we think of these things, and as they hurt, occur, you know, we may not understand them, we might not comprehend them, but these things that happen are not random occurrences at all, but they are God orchestrating the events of time, the events of history, in order to fulfill the prophecies fulfilled, uh, foretold by uh, their ancestors. You know, and I think this is certainly a lot more stunning and a lot more hard to get our, their minds around at that time to think about it that the that the uh, prophets of God had been quiet uh, before this time for 400 years, you know, since the end uh, of Malachi, you know, in that intertestamental period. You know, a lot of things happened during that time uh, that prepared the way. You know, there were social events, geopolitical events, uh, you know, that set the stage for the arrival of the Messiah. You know, uh, Paul wrote to the church in Galatians uh, in chapter 4, and Paul said, you know, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, to be born of a woman. So we, we see that at just the right time that God orchestrated, and part of God's plan is when he sent the Messiah. So Mary and Joseph, though, they wouldn't be alone in Egypt. By this time, again, Egypt was under Roman authority as well, and uh, several, many, many Jews had fled the Herods uh, and, and, that, and, their, and their reign there in uh, Palestine and had moved south. Uh, to, to get away from Herod and, uh, and his tyranny. So by that time, there were Jewish communities in Egypt and set up there, and they were able to worship, and they were able to practice their faith with some degree of freedom that they didn't have uh, back in Israel. You know, one of the most, uh, we talk about 
historical events. You know, one of the most important historical things that happened during that 400 year period in between the Testaments was the translation of the Old Testament uh, from Hebrew into Greek, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, I spoke earlier of the, again, of that, and uh, that, that translation, you know, that allowed the common person to be able to read uh, the Old Testament scripture for themselves, you know, by that time, a lot of the Jewish people may have had been away and had not really understood Hebrew uh, at that time and couldn't read Hebrew. Uh, Hebrew is very difficult to read, and they, uh, but they, they had a Greek Bible, a Greek Bible uh, in the language that they were speaking uh, that they could read. You know, when the New Testament church was established, they had a scripture in hand that they could go to, uh, that they could understand. So we see that this land that was once used to enslave the Jews, God was now using to preserve his people. In verse 19 and 20, as we move down just a little bit here, again, we see that the angel again appears to Joseph uh, as he was sleeping. I, I don't know that, I wonder if these folks ever got a good night's rest. It seems like every time we read about them in the, in the scripture here, they're, they're having a dream about something, and, uh, and an angel is, is giving them a message. But uh, again, the, the angel tells him here that Herod has died, and it's time to go back to Israel. You know, again, we see his response. Uh, in these verses, though, uh, uh, that we read here, it says, uh, The Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph, and he says, Rise and take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life were dead. And it says in the very next verse, and it says, He rose and he took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. So we see again, God gave him direction. Joseph didn't didn't wait around. He didn't... He didn't uh, waste time he said let's go we're going you know he didn't argue he didn't bargain with god but then in, in a, a second dream here though too he's given a little bit more uh direction as far as where he needs to go and this gets him back to uh, gets him back to nazareth uh because of the the son of herod that was reigning at that time in nazareth was was the less of a tyrant than the one that was reigning around bethlehem he had the, the after herod died the sons kind of split up the land there and ruled different places in, of, of the land. And you see he refers to uh, Archelaus and, and that there. And, uh, but Herod Antipas that ruled to the north in Galilee uh, was, was a little bit more benevolent, so they went there instead. So we see as God's plan, as much as it didn't necessarily make sense to us, you know, God had his son born to a young unmarried girl in a stable. The family had to flee for their lives to Egypt. And then he only to grow up in a place, an insignificant place like Nazareth, you know, in a town. That would have been on the other side of the tracks, I guess to put it in our, in our vernacular today, you know. Even the, the disciple, Nathaniel, when he was approached by Philip to say, hey, Philip says, we found the one that the law and the prophets have talked about. We found the Messiah. Uh, he's Jesus, you know, the Nazarene, you know. And Philip's response that, we, that we've all heard is, you know, can anything good come from Nazareth? Uh, you know, it seems to us in our minds that God certainly could have come up with a simpler uh, plan. But God uses average people to accomplish his purpose. And we need to be obedient when he directs us, like Joseph. But we know that God works in the big things, and he works also in the seemingly small things in our life every day. So if we, we move, continue on this morning, I think there's a couple things here that we see as well. Um, on our next slide that uh, that things that we can learn this morning from Joseph and from Mary uh, the best place or the safest place to be is to where God leads you you know thankfully again Joseph and Mary were obedient to to where they had been directed to go and what they had been told to do and they had done what they were as they were instructed um, you know I pray that that would be our mindset as well you know sometimes many of us if we, we can't see the end of the road, we, we're afraid to take that first step because we don't know where it will lead us uh, ultimately. You know, the, uh, uh, you know, we miss out on the fullness of the adventure that God has for us. You know, really the safest place, I should say the best place, not the safest place, is to be, is to be in the center of God's will. You know, to say that doesn't mean that we'll always be free from persecution will always have plenty of money we'll always have plenty of safety that that's not what that says it says but the best place for us to be is in his will so whatever path we choose god only knows where it will lead uh, 
And how much better to follow the path that he leads us down. You know, Psalm 119, the scripture tells us in Psalm 119, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know, it's not a spotlight necessarily illuminating the whole big picture and saying, you know, here's the end of the road, go this way. You know, we, God shows us enough to take a step at a time, a day at a time. And we have to be obedient enough to take that step that, that day. And then the next day, he'll show us the next step. And we take that step the next day, just like Joseph and Mary did there. So in 2022, you know, God may be calling us, maybe calling you, maybe calling me to take a step of faith. He may call us to do something that we've never done before, something that we never thought that we could do, uh, something that we would consider impossible. Of course, we know that what was it, with, all, with God, all things are possible. So I guess that kind of, uh, I know we, we take that verse out of context a lot, but we'll, we'll use it there this morning. But he says, uh, you know, he may call you to do something you never thought possibly, but uh, we do like Joseph and Mary did. We trust and we obey. And we, as a people, if we move ahead only when we can see all the variables, then we're not necessarily exercising faith at that time. But we see that the second thing there that we see is the Christian is not exempt from trouble. Like I said, the best place to be is to be where God leads us. But we could find opposition. We can find trouble where we go. You know, the birth of Christ obviously brought trouble to Mary and to Joseph and to uh, all the children around Bethlehem there eventually, uh, you know, that were killed. You know, um, but in times of trouble, it's when our, ta- our faith is tested and refined. I think two, two couple of verses here that, that speak in the, in the New Testament to trouble or to trials. James 1, this is, won't be on the slide, but y'all probably know these by heart. But James 1, and 2 and 3 says, Consider it all joy when you face trials of many kinds, because the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Again, it's, it's a process. And then Romans 5, 3 through 5 says this. It says, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So suffering for the cause of Christ is, is something that to some degree all of us are called to do. You know, and this talks about building our character and making us a product that is complete. So character building is a process. It doesn't happen easily, and it doesn't happen overnight. You know, we say, what, metals like gold, you know, they're, they're refined by fire, and, uh, and, and the heat of that fire draws out the impurities, the, the dross, I believe it is, uh, leaving behind a more pure and a more precious metal. These times may not be enjoyable, but they are necessary to conform us into the image of Christ as our hearts and minds are transformed by him. And the third thing, though, we see that even though we have trouble at times, that God is still in charge. And I think that many of you can are living testimony and to share that testimony with others. It says, I may not feel it and I may choose not to believe it, but it is still the truth. That God is still sovereign and God is still on his throne. Everything that happened in that Christmas story was known to God ahead of time. In hindsight, we can say we can see his hand in things every step of the way. Again, you probably had periods in your life in the middle of a predicament, we'll say, you know, we say, Why me, Lord? You know, why 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 am I going through this? And we don't know. But after some time, after the period of time when we look back on it and we discover that God was there with us and that God taught us some things and God there was a lesson learned in that time period. You know, Joseph in the Old Testament said to his brothers after, uh, after they were reunited, you know, he says, and all the things that had happened to Joseph there in Genesis, he said to his brothers, he said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish the saving of many lives. So Mary and Joseph probably did experience some after Christmas blues, after uh, Christmas 
problems that they had. You know, they were not able to settle in the land and live in peace. The plan they had made to get back to Nazareth and live a quiet life was at least postponed by at least a couple of years. And life was not what they had planned or had expected. But what we can learn from them and those who encountered Jesus on his birthday, like the, the shepherds and like the wise men, that in the face of difficulties, they remained focused, they remained faithful, and they stayed the course that they were given. You know, for us, at times, things don't go as we expect them to go. We have tests and we have trials, but God has provided a means for us to live victoriously, and he wants us to stay the course that our faith would not waver. You know, Hebrews tells us, he says, we run the race, we keep our eyes on him, the author and perfecter of our faith. So we, we are, keep our eyes on him. So a couple of things here, I think, or three things to, to close it down this morning that God provides for us to help us, uh, aids to help us to stay on track, to stay focused on him this morning. And we, we see that uh, this morning, I think that will be helpful to us, all of us. It says, first of all, we have access to the power of the Holy Spirit to help keep us on course, to help us run the race. You know, the Holy Spirit is the one, excuse me, the one that comes alongside of us. He is the one. He is our comforter. He is our counselor. He is the one who empowers us. Uh, you know, when we pray and we don't have the words to pray, we don't know how to pray. He, the Holy Spirit is the one who intercedes on our behalf before the Father uh, and, and speaks for us. You know, when we live in the Spirit rather than the flesh, we, we experience the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our life. We have love. We can have joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control as opposed to the fruit of the flesh. The second thing that we have this morning is that we have one another. We can depend on one another as a body of believers. The Christian is called to live in community with one another. We are one body. We are one spirit. You know, fellow believers should be the first to lift another person up. Fellow believers ought to be the first to encourage another person. Uh, and the first people that we go to when we're in need of biblical wisdom, you know, all those things that the New Testament talks about is that should not be in the church or in the, in the body of Christ, the, the backbiting, the gossip, the, the maliciousness, the anger, the arguing. All those things should never come from our mouths as believers, because we as believers have the duty and the responsibility as members of the same body to lift one another up, to encourage one another. Verse uh, in, in Hebrews that we all are familiar with, you know, it says, tells us not to neglect the assembling of ourselves together as some are in the habit of doing. But the verse before that, I, I think I actually, I like that verse a little bit better, actually. In verse 24 uh, of, ten, of chapter 10 there in Hebrews, he, he, he says this, uh, the, the author there, he says, let us consider how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds. You know, so now we're not only gathering together just for the sake of gathering together, but we gather together for the purpose of spurring one another on to love and good deeds, to encourage one another, to bless one another, to pray for one another, to you fill in the blank, you know, whatever, whatever words that I can't come up with right now. But, uh, but that's what we're called to do as a body of believers, as a body of Christ. And the third thing that we have this morning and now is we have God's holy word uh, to provide help to us as believers, to stay the course, to run the race, to walk the path. You know, God, when Jesus was tempted, we all know this in, G in Matthew 4, when Jesus was tempted and the, and the devil offered him to turn the bread into stone, he says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You know, God's word is my food, is my nourishment. And that goes back to what was said in, in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 15. He says, when your words came to me, I ate them, and they were my joy and my heart's delight. You know, oh, that, that God's word, that we would hunger and thirst after God's word, that we could say God's word is, brings delight to my heart. You know, so hopefully it wouldn't be a chore or a duty or a, a, a thing on our checklist that we have to get done that day, but that it would bring joy to, to our lives and joy our, to our hearts. And that would be uh, my prayer for myself and for all of us in the, in the coming year, that we would hunger and thirst for God's Word. We know that the God's Word is, is a benefit to all of us because 
You know, 2 Timothy 3, uh, 16 and 17 tells us that. And it says, Scripture is God-breathed. It comes from Him. He said, uh, teaching, reproof, you know, and, and, uh, and that. But it, it closes by saying that the man of God may be complete, may be competent and equipped for every good work. So the Word of God equips us. It makes us confident for the work that we're called to do. Thankfully, God did not just set the world in motion and, and walk away. But he provided a means for us to stay the path, to, to, to trust and to obey. And we're not just called to do that on our own, but we have the Holy Spirit. We have one another, and we have God's Word to help us along the way. So as our, our musicians are make their way this way this morning, and our, our prayer team, our, our counselors that are here this morning, uh, as, we, as we prepare to dismiss this morning, I just want to just close with these thoughts this this morning says that you know god sent his son that first christmas to live a perfect life for us to save us from the eternal punishment that we all deserve based on the choices that we made but he redeemed us and provided a place for us in heaven eternal like joseph we and mary we trust and obey and follow our heavenly father so, you know, we do that. How do we do that? Uh, you know, this morning, you know, first, if, if you've not done that before, that's not a decision that you've made. You know, we confess our sin and we pray for God to save us from the penalty of our sin. You know, we say, I'm no longer in charge of my life, but I want God to be in charge of my life, and I want to follow Jesus. And then we, after that, we, we have the, the blessing and we have the privilege of saying, uh, and continuing to trust him daily, to submit our hearts and our lives to him, to say, God, today is not about me, but it's about you. And I want to be your instrument of grace today. And I want to surrender my heart and surrender my life to you today. So this morning, as we stand and as we sing, if you have a prayer need this morning, the altar here is always open. If um, I'll be here as well. Some of our prayer counselors will be here as well. If you would like to pray with an individual, then we would invite you to pray. Uh, this morning, if you've been visiting with us for a while and have not yet chose to make Myrtle Grove Baptist Church your home, then we would love to have you be a part of uh, Myrtle Grove family and that you can come and you can choose to, to, to serve and to grow and to learn and, and, and just to love one another and love the Lord uh, with us today. So I pray now as we sing. seat while Stephen's coming up.
keep they keep moving the guitar stand farther and farther away for just just to make me have to move more. That's all it is. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, with it being the end of the year, the last Sunday of 2021, which is absolutely insane to me, but uh, we made it through another great year of ministry, um, and we're so excited. Uh, for all that was able to happen this year and all that we were able to do, but we're so excited for what's to come and um, what we're going to be getting into next year. With that, there's not much in the bulletin this week because we've had so many events leading up to this week. Uh, we wanted to give you guys a little bit of a, a breather, a little bit of a second, but uh, be keeping track because now that we're starting a new year, we're going to be starting new events and new opportunities to just be able to fellowship and minister with one another. And so be keeping track of that bulletin because we're going to be adding new events starting as soon as next she- next week with the, ne- the new year. So uh, we would love to see you guys get involved and be a part of all that uh, we have to come. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today. If you'd join me in closing in prayer. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to fellowship with one another and to be able to dive into your word, Lord. Thank you so much for all that you've done through Myrtle Grove, in Myrtle Grove this past year. Thank you so much for all that you continue to do, Lord. I pray that we can just find new ways to glorify you, that we can find ways to continue to worship you, that we can remember the importance and find the importance of the church and finding opportunities everywhere we go uh, to grow close to you and then to share the gospel, to share your name everywhere we go, no matter what we might be doing, Lord. Pray for this falling up here, um, that we can just continue to have great ministry, great fellowship with one another and that we can continue to spread your name and and just do the work that you have set us here to do, Lord. Lord, I pray for Pastor Josh and his family as he's uh, spending time uh, with family over in Mississippi. Keep them safe as they travel back and forth. Um, and let that be quality time, Lord. I pray for everybody who's traveling over this holiday break. Um, let them uh, enjoy this holiday break and then keep them safe as they have to travel back. Uh, and prepare all those who are getting ready to go back into a regular kind of work schedule. Just prepare their hearts for that. Um, give them a piece about all of that, Lord, and give them opportunities to boldly proclaim your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.